shot geometrically. R2 is the coordinate plane. are independent. They're not multiples of each other, so by our definition, or, or by our discussion, we know they're independent. <coughs> Why is linear independence and dependence important? Suppose I take an arbitrary point in the plane. I can associate that with the vector, sorry about my scribbling there, vector coming out of the origin. And it's and if I look at the vector 1, 0, the vector 0, 1, and the vector a, b, I know that's a dependent set because it's three vectors in a two-dimensional space. Can I express the vector a, b in terms of 1, 0, and 0, 1? It's very easy. The vector a, b is simply a times 1, 0 plus b times 0, 1. In many in linear algebra texts, this is also called e1 and e2. So this is a e1 plus b e2. It's easy to express an arbitrary vector in terms of these two. Every vector in the plane can be written as a combination of E1 and E2. This pair of vectors is called a basis. It's a linearly independent set, E1 and E2, and every vector is a linear combination of those two. Well, then the question is, is that the only pair of vectors with this property? Let me add another pair here. And the answer is no. There are lots of bases in the plane. I can take the vector 1, 1, and the vector, well, I'll make it something like uh, minus 2, 3, or something like that. Every vector, take any vector you want, A, B, it can be written as a linear combination of these two, 1, 1, call that V1, minus 2, 3, call that V2, AB is something times V1 plus something times V2. Every vector can be written as a combination of those two. The difference between V1 
this pair, D1 and D2, and this pair, E1 and E2, is. It's simple to write every vector as a combination of E1 and E2. It is not so simple to express an arbitrary vector in terms of D1 and D2. How would I do that? Let's take a specific vector here. Let's suppose this is, uh, well, this would be like one half and four, okay? Arbitrary vector, one half and four. So, how can I express this vector as a combination of D1 and D2? So, I want one half comma four to be something times one one plus something times minus 2, 3. This says that C1 minus C2 has to be 1 half. And C1 plus 3C2 has to be 4. Can I solve that pair of equations? Sure, it's a simple pair. Uh, minus 2? Uh, where is it? C1 minus 2C2? C1 uh, minus 2C2. Can I solve that pair of equations? Yeah. So then I will have expressed 1 half 4 in terms of V1 and V2. What is 1 half and 4 in terms of E1 and E2? It is simply 1 half E1 plus 4 E2. So E1, E2 is a nice pair. V1 and V2, not so much, because it's a little harder to express an arbitrary vector in terms of that. But in practical applications, you might want to have the freedom to pick your pair of vectors, which you're going to use as a basis. 1, 0, 0, 1 is very nice for many applications, but there are applications where there are better, or better uh, more efficient bases than E1 and E2. So that's what linear independence is about. Okay? You're in Rn. You're in n-dimensional space. Two or three or four. What you want to find is a set of linearly independent vectors with the property that every vector is a combination of them. So that's why linear independence is important. Extremely important. For our purposes, all we want to do is distinguish when is a given set of vectors independent, when is a given set of vectors dependent. <laughs> We're not going into trying to find bases for Rn. Right? We're not going to go that far. We just want to tackle independence and dependence. Okay. So we have the definition, two vectors, dependent if and only if they're multiple independent otherwise. So you, you just look at it. Uh, V1 and V2 here are dependent because V2 is 0 times V1. So it's a multiple of V1. V1 and V2 uh, lower down here, these are independent. They're not multiple of each other. Okay. In R2, the maximum number of independent vectors is 2. So if I have three vectors, they have to be dependent. And as a matter of fact, uh, I could uh, clearly V1 and V2 are independent. They're not multiples of each other. V3 is a combination of V1 and V2. It is a combination of those three. Okay. So, testing for independence and dependence basically produces a system of equations. So, we're back to solving systems of equations. All right. Okay. I think we, uh, we mentioned that, and we did this in section 5.4. If you have a homogeneous system of 
equations. With more unknowns than there are equations, that always has infinitely many solutions. That's another reason why four vectors in three space have to be dependent. Just because you can write down the definition, you get three equations and four unknowns. And that always has non-trivial solutions. Okay. So, well, we did all these examples last time, but remember, I'm going to get to the where we where we left off. Uh, we did all of these examples. Here are, remember this one, here are four vectors in three spaces. The vectors contain a parameter that is an unspecified component. What are the values of A? Well, what values of A are the, well, should have put up top here. For what values of A I think I mentioned that uh, we sometimes put a question like this on the exam. You hate to lose 10 points on this. What values of A is V1, V2, V3, V4 linearly independent? Answer, no values of A. We sometimes ask this question this way. Those vectors are automatically dependent. You got four vectors, three space, have to be dependent. I don't care what A is. <clears throat> Can ask this question two ways. What values of A are these vectors independent? Answer none. Or what values of A are these vectors dependent? Answer all values of A. So you have to be you have to read the question carefully. Okay. So if, if I want to find, you know, okay, now, now we're looking at V1, V2, V3. I want to figure out the values of A for which they are dependent. I'm find the values of A for which they are dependent. All I have to do is solve this system of equations. So you can write down the augmented matrix and row reduce. Or all you really need is the matrix of coefficients, because whatever you do, the zeros are going to remain zero. So you can just write down the matrix of coefficients, row we'll reduce that. Or you can calculate the determinant. Remember, determinant equal to determinant not zero means unique solution. Which means zero, zero, zero is the only solution. So we calculated the determinant, and we, if the determinant is zero, then we know that that homogeneous system has infinitely many solutions. So just calculate the determinant. That's a little easier in this case. And we got a equal four, a equal minus one. So uh, the vectors are linearly independent for all A different from 4 and minus 1. They're dependent 4 and minus 1, independent for all other A's. Okay, and I think we did this one too. Here's four vectors in four dimensional space. So they could be independent. Be dependent. One way to find out, calculate the determinant. I think in this case, as I recall earlier, I decided to row reduce them because there was another question. What is the maximum number of independent vectors here? Looking at these four, how many of them are independent? I can clearly see that V1 and V2 are independent. I row reduce, and it turns out there were two rows of zeros, so there are only two independent vectors, and that's it. 
this two rows of zeros basically means, basically it means V3 and V4 are combinations of V1 and V2. But you can't tell by just looking at it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to calculate these terms. So here are the tests for independence of two vectors. You've got K vectors in Rn. There's only three possibilities. K is bigger than N. K is equal to N. K is less than N. If K is bigger than N, they're automatically be Or you can solve the system of equations. Wait, that would be a waste of time. Oh, I skipped that. I skipped that. I skipped that. I skipped that. I K is bigger than n. K equals n. Form the n by n matrix, whose rows are the given vectors. If the reduced matrix has, a no, has all non-zero rows, the vectors are independent. All non-zero rows means your row-reduced form has ones down the diagonal, and the system has a unique solution, which is zero, 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 zero. One or more non-zero, one or more zero rows, the vectors are dependent. So you just write down the matrix, row reduce it. You get a row of zeros, they're dependent. All the rows are non-zero, they're independent. Or you can solve the system of equations, but that's, gonna, that's just the same as, as writing down the matrix and row reducing. Because how would you solve this system? You could write out the system, write the augmented matrix, and row reduce it. So you might as well just write them down and row reduce to begin with. Or calculate the determinant. Determinant not zero, independent. Determinant zero, dependent. Now, if which of these is, is uh, which, what should you do? Well, for, for a three by three, for uh, three vectors in three space, it's probably quicker to calculate the determinant than it is to write down the matrix in row reducing. Probably quicker to do the determinant. Great, uh, and greater than three, well, then it gets a little dicey. Because the larger n is, the harder it is to calculate the determinant. So for me, 4 and above, I'll typically write down the matrix and row reduce it. But for 3, I've just calculated the determinant. Determinant not 0 independent, determinant 0 dependent. If k is smaller than n, now think about it. Here you're in 3 space, well, say you're in 4 space. And you've got three vectors. The chances are they are independent. The chances are. If I wrote down the vectors just randomly, I'll guarantee you they're independent. But if someone writes them down very carefully, he could make them dependent. So when k is less than n, they're either independent or dependent. And really, your only option is to row reduce. Write right down the matrix and row reduce. That, that's really your only option. You get a row of zeros, dependent, no non-zero rows, they're independent. So that's how you test a set of vectors for independence and dependence. Typical question is something like this one the example we had right here. Right there, where is it? Here it is. Yeah. For what values of A are V1, V2, V3 dependent? Or for what values of A are they independent? The question can be phrased either way. That's a typical kind of question. Okay. So that takes care of independence, dependence of vectors. Now we'll look at independence, dependence of functions. Same definition. You've got a set of k functions, all defined on some interval. The set is linearly dependent. Same definition. 
said it's literally dependent. If there exists k numbers, she wants you to up to see k, not all zero, such that this sum is identical to zero. Okay, so the functions are dependent. If you can find k numbers, not all of which are zero, so that the sum is identical. And they're independent otherwise. If the only way that sum can be zero is to have all the coefficients equal to zero. Clearly, if you make c1, c2, up to ck all <laughs> zero, then the left side is zero. The question is, can you find c's which are not all zero, such that this sum is zero? If the only way that sum can be zero is to have all of the coefficients zero, then the vector functions are independent. So let's go take three functions, 1x and x squared. I want to see if they're independent or dependent. Okay. Well, suppose they are dependent. Suppose you can find three numbers, not all zero, so that c1 times 1 plus c2 times x, c3x squared is identically zero. That is, c1 plus c2x, c3x squared equals 0 for all x. Now, could you find three numbers so that that sum is 0 for all x? If you think about it, one way to think about it is, look, this is a quadratic. Right? How many numbers make a quadratic equal to 0? Two. Right? So this cannot be zero for all x because a quadratic is zero only for two x, or maybe one x, or maybe no x. So this could not be zero for every x. It would say every x is a zero of a quadratic. So one x x squared have to be independent. As a matter of fact, we can conclude that the, the, that the uh, functions 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, and so on, are independent. Because if, if you go 1, x, all the way up to x to the n, write down this expression, you get a polynomial of degree n. How many zeros can a polynomial of degree n have? At most, n. <laughs> So it cannot be zero for every x. Okay. Well, that's not the only way to look at it or, or, or tackle this question. So let me add a page. So let's suppose there are three numbers. C1, C2, C3. Not all zero. Such that C1 plus C2x plus C3x squared equals zero. You know what, I, I put three lines there, meaning identically zero. Zero for all x. So let me write it this way. For equals zero. For all x. Suppose there were three numbers. So that that would then what could I say if I take the derivative? What's the derivative of c1? It's a constant, it's zero. What's the derivative of c2x? That's c2. What's the derivative of c3x squared? 2c3x. And what's the derivative of zero? Zero. So if this was zero for every x, then this would be zero for every x. Because the derivative of zero is zero. If this is zero for every x, then 2c3 is zero. Right? I'll just put the derivative again, which says c3 is zero. So if this is zero for every x, then c3 has to be zero. Because I just differentiated three times, isolated c3 has to be zero. If c3 is zero, what is c2? 
C2 has to be zero because this equation has to hold. If C3 and C2 are both zero, C1 has to be zero. So there cannot be three numbers so that that's zero for every A. Okay? The point is this is another way to show that one X and X squared are independent. One way is observe this is a quadratic. It's only zero twice at most. Another way is to just well, suppose there were numbers, then look at this expression, take the derivative. These are differentiable functions. You take uh, uh, two derivatives and you find C3 has to be zero, so C2 has to be zero, so C1 has to be zero. So there could have been three numbers, not all three numbers. How about sine and cosine? But what I'm saying is, in general, the powers of x are independent functions. Sine x and cosine x. Well, suppose you had two numbers, not both zero, so that C1 cosine plus C2 sine is identically zero. By that I mean equals zero for all x. Okay. Well, oops, sorry. Let's finish this up. So uh, let x equal zero. These are, this is zero for every x, right? So let x equal zero. That gives us C1 cosine 0, C2 sine 0, and this is 0. But the sine of 0 is 0. So this is C1 cosine of 0 is 1. C1 is 0. OK? So if C1 cosine plus C2 sine is 0 for every x, it have to be 0 when x is 0 which implies c1 is 0. Suppose you let x equal pi over 2. Then you get c1 cosine pi over 2. By the way, we already know c1 is 0. Plus c2 sine pi over 2. And that's 0. Because this is 0 for every x. But we know this is 1. I'm sorry, this is 0. This is 1. C2 must be 0. The only way that can be 0 for every x is C1 and C2 are both. <coughs> sine and cosine are equal. How about sine, cosine, and twice cosine x plus pi over 2? Independent or dependent? Independent or dependent? Does anybody know? believe they are dependent. It's true. Cosine. What is the cosine of x plus pi over 3? It's uh, 1 half cosine x minus the square root of 3 over 2 sine x. It's the addition formula, right? I, I, I did it in my head. I, I think I did it. This is <coughs> cosine x, cosine pi over 3, minus sine x, sine <coughs> pi over 2. Right? So it's a dependent set because I can write this function as a combination of those two. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. This is not in two space. The question was, well, look, you got two vectors, you got three vectors, two spades. But look, let me tell you, <coughs> you we agree that, uh, well, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on, they're independent. So if you look at the set of continuous functions, that's an infinite dimensional set. Because I can give you infinitely many independent functions, namely the powers of x. Okay? So, when you're looking at functions, you can forget about r2, r3, and more vectors than space. 
because the function space is infinite dimensional. Now you will recall, or some of you will, and we'll have to if you're thinking about getting 195 or whatever, 190 on the exam, e to the x is what? 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus and so on, right? So I'm writing e to the x as a combination of the powers of x. Okay? Right? But it's not a fun, uh, this, this, this is an infinite series. It's an infinite linear combination. Which is another way of telling me that function space is infinite dimensional. Because functions like e to the x, it takes infinitely many vectors to write down a linear combination. Sine x, you see, has an expansion. It's a combination, a linear combination of powers of x. That's, you know, that's one way to view the last chapter, the last section you had in Calculus 2, where you looked at Taylor series. You're expressing functions as combinations of powers of x. Another reason why linear independence and dependence is so important, you will learn, some of you will learn, especially electrical engineers, that, okay, so I can express e to the x as a combination of powers of x, but it's not the best way. It's better to express them in terms of sines and cosines. And those are called Fourier series rather than power series. You will be stuck with those, or if, or if you take uh, 3363, you'll be expressing functions as combinations of sines and cosines rather than powers of x because they're better for the, for the application purpose. All right. What's the test for independence and dependence? Well, you've got k functions. Assume they're k minus 1 times differential. You write down the determinant. The first row is the functions. The second row is their derivatives. Finally, all the way down to the k minus, well, to the kth row, which is the k minus first derivative. You calculate that determinant. If it's not zero for at least one x, they're independent. If it is zero for every x, well, then that's a that's a real question. It might be independent, might be dependent. Not zero for at least one x, independent. Identically zero, you don't. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. That determinant is called the function. Of course, this course. You know, it's not just little separated topics, right? It all, really all, hang, almost all hangs together. The only thing out of the ordinary in this course was separable equations and homogeneous equations. And Everything else was linear, as I've said. Anyway. So, same old terms. Okay. Uh, let me, I think I have an example. Yeah. Look at the, uh, look at x cubed. And f2 is minus x cubed for x less than 0. And it's 2x cubed for x greater than or equal to 0. OK? These functions, the graph of these functions, well, you know what x cubed, I wish I could. I hate graphs. I can't draw a particular graph. Here, here is. F1, right? That's what x cubed looks like. And F2, I could even use for you a different color. Yeah, what color? What color would you like? Oh, I'll pick blue. F2 looks like this. This is F2. Now those functions are independent. 
two functions, they just have two functions. To be dependent, they have to be multiples of each other. All right? Two functions, just like two vectors. To be dependent, they have to be multiples of each other. If they're not, then they're independent. So these functions are independent. But if you calculate their Ronskian, well, for x less than 0, you have x cubed minus x cubed, 3x squared minus 3x squared, and the determinant is 0. For x bigger than or equal to 0, you have x cubed, 3x squared, 2x cubed, 6x squared, that's like the determinant, is 0. So the Ronskian is identically 0, and yet the vectors are independent. Functions are independent. Why did I pick, why did I go like x cubed here? Uh, the reason is, in order to calculate the Ronskian, they have to be differentiable. You know, uh, some people would say, well, why don't you pick f1 equal to x and f2 equal to absolute x? Then you get a pair of functions. Here is f1. And I'm going to go back to the red. And here is F2. They are independent. But I cannot use the Ronskian to show that the Ronskian is identically zero because they're not differential. In particular, F2 is not differential. Okay. So. Here are three functions. Are they independent or are they dependent? And calculate the runs. It's zero. And that tells you nothing. Runs can zero. Then you don't know. So what do you do? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. For these to be, let's see, what's the best way to say it? Maybe I'll say it this way. Might be the easiest way to remember. If you've got, for example, three functions, Ronsky is identically zero. Okay? It's, it's almost certain that they are dependent. It's almost certain that they are dependent. Because to have Ronskian identically zero, to be independent, and have Ronskian identically zero, you have to, where, where are my, uh, where is my example? You have to go to something like this. Okay? So if you have three simple, for example, three simple functions, Ronskian is zero. You just really don't know that they're dependent, but the chances are that they are. Because to get an example of three functions, or even two functions, whose Ronskian is identically zero and independent, you have to go to an example something like this. So, so, here I have three functions. Their Ronskian is zero. The, I, the test doesn't tell me anything. But because they are just ordinary functions, right, nothing special, like that, I believe they're dependent. So you have to show that. That's what you'll be asked to do. Right? You'll be given a set of functions, and you're going to be asked, are they independent or dependent? If the Ronskian is not identically zero, you're done. They're independent. If the Ronskian is identically zero, you don't know. So you're going to have to find out. All right. So the question is then, does there exist three numbers, c one, c two, c three, not all zero, so that this sum is identically zero? Or you could say this another way. I guess I'm going to have to add a page. Um, 
going to show you this one. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to say that another way is one of the functions a linear combination of the other two. That's another way to say it. Can I express, for example, F1 as a combination of F2 and F3? That, 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 might, that might require maybe just a little bit of explanation. So let's look here. Suppose there are three numbers not all zero, such that that sum is identically zero. Now these numbers, C1, C2, C3, they're not all zero. At least one of them is not zero. Suppose C1 was not zero. <coughs> Suppose C1 was the one, a one, a one, which was not zero. Well then, F1 is minus C2 over C1 times F2, minus C3 over C1 times F3. So if these vectors, if these functions are dependent, then that means one of them is a linear combination of the other two. So let's, let's look at that. Is one of the functions a linear combination of the other two? So let's see. I'm, I'm going to say, uh, for example, is F1 a combination of F2 and F3? Nothing magic about F1. I could pick any one. Try to write it as a combination of the other two. Well, let's see whether it is. So 2x plus 1 has to be c1 times f2, which is x minus 3, plus c2 times f3, which is 3x plus 2. So this says 2x plus 1 has to be um, C1 plus 3C2 times X. The coefficient of X on the right is C1 plus 3C2 plus minus 3C1 plus C2C2. C2. This says that C1 plus 3C2 has to be 2. And it says minus 3c1 plus 2c2, that has to be 1. Does that pair of equations have a solution? Well, it's easy enough to find out, right? I'll multiply the first equation by 3. So this is uh, 9c2 plus 2c2 is 11c2 is equal to 6 plus 1 is 7. c2 is 11, 7 elevenths. And c1 is whatever it is. Right? Uh, I you have to figure this out. Um, 7 elevenths here, that's 21 elevenths. Bring it over here, it's minus 21 elevenths plus 22 elevenths. So you see, F1 is 1 11 times F2 plus 7 11 times F3. So they are dependent because one of them is a combination of the other two. All right. Okay. So uh, that takes care of that. So let's look. Going back to systems of equations, here's n equations in m unknown. You can write it in matrix vector form. This is why the matrix multiplication is defined the way it is, so that you can represent that system of equations using matrices and vectors. 
you can look at a matrix as a, lin as a linear transformation. Because A times X plus Y is AX plus AY. Remember the distributive law? That's why they're important. And A times alpha X is just alpha times AX. I said you could move the scalar anywhere you want. That fact means that a matrix really represents a linear transformation. Look at the matrix 1, 2, minus 1, 3, 0, 2. It, in fact, is a transformation from R3 into R2. Here's A. For example, A times 1, 2, 3. What is that? It's 1, 2, minus 1, 3, 0, 2, times 1, 2, 3. And what is this? 1 plus 4 is 5. Minus 3 is 2. 3 plus 6 is 9. A takes this vector to that vector. A is a mapping. I'm, I'm beginning to introduce the next section. I've got to check my time. Oh, I plenty of time. Of course, we're going to have to pop a few. So you can get out your form. Uh, not like the set. I mean, you can get a form. I'm not going to have to copy that right now. You see, A maps 1, 2, 3. That goes to the vector 2, 9. I give you a different vector here, you get a different vector right here. You can think of a matrix as being a function, which takes vectors to vectors. In particular, this matrix takes 3D vectors to 2D vectors. Okay. So, you know, the way you can view a system of equations, suppose I pick the vector here, I'm going to pick the vector 7, 4. What vector over here does A map to 7, 4? We want a times x, y, z to be 7, 4. Right? I take a vector here. I can tell you what A does to that vector. A takes 1, 2, 3, or whatever it was, 4, 9. But suppose I take a vector over here and ask what vector does A map from here to the vector I chose here. Can I figure out what x what vector a maps to 7, 4? Can I can I figure out what, what x, y, z are? Well, this would say, you know, let me add a page here. What we want, I'll write it down again, we want a. We want a. Six. This is plus three plus two is five. 
minus 21 plus 4 is minus 17. This says 1, 2, minus 1, 7, 0, 1, minus 5, 6, plus 17, 6. And what do I find? Y is, is 17, 6 plus 5, 6, Z. X is 7 plus Z minus 2Y, which is whatever it is, Z arbitrary. What does this mean? Not only is there one vector which maps to 7, 4, there's infinitely many vectors which map to 7. Well, there's tons of them over here which get mapped to 7, 4. We're just not doing enough in it when your algebra can get you a big feeling for the subject. But what we're doing is mapping three space onto two space. Three space is much bigger. Okay? It's huge. Right? So we're mapping a big, big thing onto a much smaller thing. So sure it's no surprise that many things over here map into something over here. It's covered many times. Okay. Okay, so we can write the system as AX equal B. We've seen all this before. So how are you going to solve AX equal B? We have, well, we have always have to write down the system of equations for over two children. That always works. Do I want to find the inverse of A? Well, you can't, this A matrix doesn't have an inverse. Only square matrices have inverse. Do I want to use Krager's rule? Only square matrices have determinants. So if the system is not square, you have to row reduce. That's the only option. If the system is square, you have several options. But the only one you want to use is row reducing. Because calculating the inverse, well, you might as well just row reduce. You're going to row reduce and then some to find the inverse. And certainly want to do that. And calculating the determinant is a huge pain as soon as you get above three. So row reducing is really your only option. Okay. Oh, let's see. Oh. Well, I guess we're ready to start uh, now that we've introduced the idea of a matrix as a mapping. A three by three matrix is a mapping from R3 to R3. Because, you see, if I multiply, but look, if I multiply this A by the vector 1, 1, 1, I get the vector minus 1, 1, 1. Okay, so what we'll look, we'll look at it this way, we got A, which is 3 by 3, times V, which is 3 by 1, and that equals whatever I call it here, say V, right, which is, well, look, a 3 by 3 times a 3 by 1 is what? 3 by 1. So a 3 by 3 matrix maps R3 into R3. In particular, my 3 by 3 maps 1, 1, 1 to minus 1, 1, 1. You just, you just calculate it out. It maps 1 minus 3, 2 to 12 minus 2, 13. I just, I just picked, you know, nice simple vectors here. It maps 3, 2 minus 3 to minus 6, 4, 6. You can check these. But notice, minus 6 minus 4, 6 is minus 2 times the original vector. The result here is not related to the input here. The result here is related to the input here. It's minus two times this. If you look at 
A times 101, you get 202, which is 2 times 101. It's curious, and this is what we want to look at, A maps this vector into something. A maps this vector into something. A maps that vector into a multiple of itself. Let's see, can I pull it up? Let me add a page or two later. So we've got, you know, R3. We've got R3. We've got A. If you look at my first vector, you know, 1, 1, 1, you know, it, you know, it looks say like that. And it gets mapped into a vector, maybe which looks like that. And the second vector, you know, which looks like this, gets mapped into a vector which looks like that. But, go back to uh, this one side. If you look at 101, one, which say looks like, well, let me just say it looks like that, it gets mapped into a vector which lies on the same line and is twice as long. It gets mapped onto a multiple of itself. So that's what this section is about. Eigenvalues, eigenvectors. This here is whole and eigenvalue. And this is its eigenvectors. We want to find eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And n by n matrix has n eigenvalues. And each eigenvalue has an eigenvector, or maybe a lot of them. It does have lots. Okay. So A is an N, but we're only looking at square matrices. Most of the stuff, you know, is about square matrices, because the others are not particularly interesting. A number lambda is an eigenvalue. If you can find a non-zero vector V, so that A, V is lambda V. So we want to find eigenvalues, eigenvalues. So let's look at this. So we want to find this, by the way, is crucial for the next chapter. Next chapter is all about systems of differential equations in which you have to find eigenvalues, eigenvalues. We want to find eigenvalues, eigenvalues. Do. So we're trying to find a number lambda and a vector v so that a v is lambda v. So let's see. A v is lambda v. This says a v minus lambda v is zero. Right? Of course. Just, I just want the lambda v over here. <coughs> this says that a minus lambda identity times v is zero. I need to write the identity here, you see, because a minus lambda doesn't make any sense. It, it can't, you know, subtraction of a vector and a number is clearly not defined. There. So we want to find, we want to find a v so that a minus lambda i times v is zero. V is non-zero. We're looking for a non-zero vector. Non-zero. Which means, so we want, if you look at this, it's, it's, a, it's a homogeneous system. It has non-zero solutions. This means the determinant of A minus lambda i has to be zero. If you've got a homogeneous system with non-trivial solutions, okay, the determinant of the matrix of coefficients has to be zero. 
So all we got to do to find eigenvalues is to find the numbers lambda so that the determinant of a minus lambda i is zero. So, take an example. Take a, b, four. One, two, three, four. Not very imaginative, but there's an a. What is a minus lambda i? It's two minus lambda, three, one, four minus lambda. What is the determinant of a minus lambda i? It's this determinant, which is a times d minus b times c. So 2 minus lambda times 4 minus lambda minus 3. Lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 5 has to be 0. So lambda 1 is 5 and lambda 2 is 1. This factors into lambda minus i times lambda So if lambda 1 is 5, if lambda is 5 or 1, then that determinant is 0, which means this system has non-trivial solutions. Okay. So these are the eigenvalues. Three by three. It's a little more interesting, three by three. There's the determinant A minus lambda. As you can clearly see, the determinant is lambda minus lambda cubed plus lambda squared plus four lambda minus four. Well, you probably can't see that. You've got to work it out. And you don't have any choice. And this will be question like this, certainly will be on exam three. Two by twos, trivial, right? You got a simple quadratic, then you find the two roots. You can make that a multiple choice, perhaps. But we want to find out if you can really calculate eigenvalues, eigenvalues. We've got to give you three by three. So, here is, here is, you know, this matrix here is A minus lambda I. We want to calculate its determinant. You will find out that this is you know, not so easy. What you get, if you calculate that determinant, one of the products you know is this times this times this, so it's a cubic. This, by the way, is called, of these terms will come up, this is called the characteristic equation. Or, yeah, the characteristic equation. Oh, sorry, this is the characteristic We want to find the roots. So how do you find the roots of minus lambda cubed plus lambda? You, you can change the sign. That doesn't change the roots, right? Just multiply by minus 1. Can you find the roots of that? I, I'm, I'm looking at a sea of blank stairs, and I'm not a bit surprised. Do you remember section 3.7, where I would give you a third order homogeneous equation? and ask for the solutions. You got a third order polynomial, right? Right? And you had to find the roots. And what did we do to help you? You gave us a hint. So when I give you a three by three matrix, we will give you a hint, all right? And of course, once you have the hint, the hint actually serves two purposes because I'll guarantee you, because it happens to me all the time, when I calculate this determinant, there's so damn many calculations to do, I make a mistake. All right? So I don't actually have the right characteristic polynomial. But I use my hint to check. I take my hint, I put it in here. If it works, if I get zero, then I'm probably right. If I don't get zero, then I know I'm wrong, and I got to go back and recalculate. And I often have to go back and recalculate at least once, if not more. So this is not so easy, just calculating that three by three. Then we're only just scratching the surface. That's just step one. Step two is to find the eigenvectors. There's a lot more calculations to do, and I'll do those next time.
Okay, so let's see. We'll have our popcorn.